So welcome to the Hold the Line podcast. I am so pumped about this today. We're actually, I am out here and I'm a guest actually in your studio, Real Faith. Yeah, thanks this for coming amazing. out to Scottsdale. Man. Oh, thank you and for having us. It was great to meet your wife and kids. I mean, you can know a guy and then you meet his wife and kids and that's the resume. Dude, you got a beautiful family. Your wife and kids are really sweet. That was special. Yeah, well, they were, they were so pumped to come and... Uh, Thanks for hooking them up with some water slide action. Great Wolf Lodge. You probably still smell like chlorine. Great Wolf Lodge. I'm <laughs> telling y'all, that is something. That's a that's a place right there. I'm going to need a vacation after the vacation. <laughs> um, no, it was so fun to be with you guys at church yesterday and just to see your world and, you know, what you're doing and, and, and just an incredible community, just yeah. an amazing community. And, of course, you got the church, you got your teaching ministry, stuff's going all around the world. I got so many questions I want to ask you today. Um, I don't know, maybe let's start with what God is doing right now here with you guys, like this season that you're in. Give us an update. Give people out there an update. So yeah, uh, Grace and I have been faithfully married 30 years. Love her with all my heart. And um, we've got five kids. They all love and serve Jesus, mm -hmm. which is amazing. We had no rebels, no prodigals, no apostates, no deconstructionists. Um, and so that's, that is something to be said, bro. Yeah. If you don't, we want to receive that anointing, <laughs> trust yeah. me in our family for sure. They're great. And, uh, so we've got real faith ministries that is uh, run by my son-in-law Landon mm -hmm. and uh, our daughter Ashley, and they're pregnant with their first child. We're wow. actually going to go out to dinner tonight and find out if it's a church planner or a church planner's wife, you know, so we'll see. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then, um, we have a church ministry that we planted as a family that's doing incredibly well. It's a beautiful, mm -hmm. loving, healthy, really remarkable church family. Right. And uh, all the kids serve there. And so our second son is married to his middle school sweetheart, and they've got their first kid on the way, a baby boy. Our middle son is getting ready to graduate. He's engaged. And so we've got a wedding and two babies this year. And then we got a daughter in college and a son in high school. It is the best, most blessed season of my whole life. Wow. I love this season. Wow. I love Arizona. I get to do ministry with my family. I get to send Bible teaching out around the world. Yeah. Like I drove in with the top off the first edition Bronco so Jesus could see me smile. I'm doing good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You definitely could not do that in the Pacific Northwest. No, 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 no. And we had a wonderful run. We got to see you know, maybe 10,000 people baptized. God did incredible things. And then he pivoted us out to have a healthy place for our family mm -hmm. and to get more Bible teaching out than any time in my life. And wow. so I am reaching more people with Bible teaching. I'm an old school Bible teacher uh, than any time in my whole life, but I'm yeah. doing so with my family mm -hmm. in a healthy lifestyle. It's right. it's really incredible. Wow, that's amazing. I, 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 I have such... Um, admiration and respect for people that have been in ministry as long as you have and have seen as much as you have and have been through the fire to see such a joy you know i think that that's like i understand i mean i've been in ministry a long time too and there's seasons where it's more difficult and there's seasons that are grueling but i think there's something that's missing uh and maybe we don't promote enough in ministry that hey there's a joy in this thing like god, oh there is god releases blessing on your family just like you're saying your family is thriving you know they're in it and and you can do ministry you can run hot after jesus you don't have to lose your family in the midst of it no you know you don't have to lose your marriage you know you can remain faithful and true and god can bestow his blessings like he is in your life well and then and in that, like my kids are doing wonderful things for the Lord. My wife yeah. is doing wonderful things for the Lord. So it's not like I want to ignore them so I can serve the Lord. I want to see what God has for right. each of us. And so I, I firmly believe I'm right dead bullseye in the will of God for my life in this season. I believe I am on the target. Yeah. And so that's, that's really all you can do is just say, Lord, you know, what's your will for me and walk in that. Yeah. And as long as you do that, you should wake up really joyful because yeah. uh, you're in the will of God and God is going to assist you in that season. Yeah. So what is your, maybe just a quick, even in this intro, what, what, what would be your quick takeaway or encouragement to, to young people that are in ministry that maybe have, 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 have bought the lie 
that it's going to be grueling. It's going to be brutal. You know, you don't know if your family is going to make it. Da, 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 da. Like, what, what would your encouragement be to them or ha- things that you've learned through those seasons? Well, the, well, anti-ministry is always going to happen. If right. you're trying to do ministry, Satan, demons, religious people right. are going to do anti-ministry. Right. And so you just can't get discouraged by the anti-ministry. You've got to press through it, knowing if there's resistance, there must right. be something significant on the other side. Right. It's like in a battle, man. If, you, if, you, if you're taking a lot of fire, you must be yeah. near a crucial target. Right. And so for me, like when there's pressure and there's opposition, like, man, we must be getting close to something big. Right. And so I don't get discouraged by that. I fight through it. And yeah. I think resilience is just necessary. Yeah. Part of it too, if you're younger, you need a mentor, spiritual mothers and right. fathers yeah. that can help guide you through it. Right. They've been through the battle. I think right. you need um, governance structure that allows you like, you know, you've got a ministry, I've got a ministry for, for those of us that are in the local church. Sometimes it's the governance structure that really screws up the family. Right. Because if the board is run, you know, like the government and there's constituencies and politics right. and intrigue and infighting and betrayal. Yeah. I mean, some churches, the pastor and, and their family, they're like, we know what God wants us to do. It's just trying right. to get around and through the stupid right. governance yeah. structure. Right. You know, we saw that in America a few years ago, you know, the wrong kind of government can really screw everything up. Right. And the church has a government. Right. And unless it's set up right, it's yeah. killing pastors and their families. Like even during COVID, think about how many guys are like, I want to be open. I right. want to be rolling. Right. And the board said no. Right. And, right. You know, totally. you know, mask Molly, you know, filed a complaint. Totally. And, yeah. You know, six foot Sam, yeah. we need to social distance. He's freaking right. out. And it's just, and so for me, you know, most churches are built for peacetime, not for war. And they right. only work until there's a war. Right. And that's where the family gets really hurt. You know, I, it's 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 so amazing. I'm 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 so grateful to have amazing boards and in, in my nonprofits. But I just think like, what if, you know? So God calls you to do something. I mean, you look at, you know, you were talking about yesterday. Um, these here, like Elijah, these heroes in the Bible, like God tells them to do something. Well, let me go consult with my board. And yeah, let me go take let, a let boat. Me, let me get a full approval before I can. So there is something to be said about layers of bureaucracy that can hamstring us to from doing what God's called us to do. Yeah. You know, I see that a lot. It's, well, it's, a lot of times what they call accountability is is really hindrance. Right. It's uh, it's handing power to the least healthy people. Yeah. And I believe if somebody's going to be an authority over a leader, they should be godly, older, right. and healthy, right. having done something bigger. Yeah. Other than that, basically, you've just got a mob. Yeah. Wow. Yes, you do. You do. And then and then you have a whole lot more people you have to appease. Um, I'm so interested in this. This is what I really want to talk about today. I was just praying about, Lord, what are some things that we can discuss that would bring revelation, illuminate people's hearts um, as they listen to this? And this, this uh, survey came out today from the Wall Street Journal. That and, alt-right publication that's just furthering the yes, family agenda. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, we know that. We know that that, that alt-right, those those guys over there yeah. at the Wall Street Journal. The Christian nationalists running yeah. the Wall Street so, Journal. So so they're so they're publishing this survey that's kind of going wild across Twitter and the internet, um, basically comparing uh, 1998, the values of people in America in 1998 to the values of people in America in 2023. So 25 years. Yeah. So there, and they, they break it down to patriotism, religion, having children, community involvement, and money. There's numerous things, but those are the top five that they focus on. So in 1998, percentage of people that say patriotism is very important, uh, this is both sides of the aisle, so Republican, Democrats. Uh, and patriotism, 70% of people say, yes, patriotism is important. 2023, we see 38% say patriotism is important. Religion, uh, 1998, 62% say it's important. 2023, 39%. Having children, uh, 59% in 1998 say that's important. 30% in 2023 say that's important, um, which 
you know, it's 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 like that that one for sure is not a shock to me. Giving the degrading of human life, giving yep. the this narrative that even the church is bought into that children are a, are a, a, a nuisance, inconvenience, and a worry, or an option, or yeah, they're or like option. a luxury item. Yeah, I mean, it's so so demonic. Um, community involvement has gone from sixty two percent feeling like that's important to twenty seven percent money. In 1998, was 31% uh, th felt like that was important, and then now that's jumped up to 43%. So what take you of this survey? Like, what do you think? You were pastoring in 98, right? I've been a senior pastor 27 years. I've been okay. a pastor 30 years. So I, okay. I was pastor back in 90. I was a senior pastor in 98. And, okay. um, and so I think this is, you know, as I was thinking about on the drive-in, like, Right now, what's running kind of wokeism is really deconstructionism. Right. And, you know, there's, I, I wrote a book, uh, Christian Theology versus Critical Theory. It's free, you know, whatever. But basically, there's two different theories that drive nations and academia. Uh, one is uh, construction, which right. is traditional theory, the other right. is deconstruction. Right which is progressive. And so, you know, deconstruction is how do we dismantle religion and God and the church? And then how do we right. dismantle the government and law enforcement? And then yeah. how do we dismantle gender? And how do we dismantle family? And how right. do we dismantle community? And how do we dismantle personal identity? I mean, it literally is just this wrecking ball that just keeps swinging and deconstructing right. and demolishing everything. And so what you're seeing here is like, what do you live for? And right. you've got two options. I'm, I'm a Bible teacher. So is your primary meaning and value found going in or going out? Right. If it's going out, it's like, okay, I live for God. Boom, deconstruct God. Okay, I live for the well-being of my nation and our people. Boom, deconstruct the nation. Okay, I live for the well-being of my community. Boom, deconstruct it. I live for the well-being of my family. Boom, deconstruct it. Right. You're down to the point where it's just me. I have wow. no, I come from nowhere. Wow. I, I, I belong to <clears throat> no one. I'm here for nothing. And when I die, I'm going nowhere. That's where we are. And so that survey, it correlates with the Pew research that comes out every decade, right. just showing massive mental health for right. younger generations, right. massive suicidal ideation right. for young women. And then the CDC report, you know, we'll follow the science because the CDC is always super accurate, you know, saying that uh, young men are cratering, they're not in yeah. the workforce, they're not in church, they're not right. in romantic relationships, right. um, you know, not in the labor force is a massive new category of young men. And so you just look at it, you're like, well, how's it going? It's dying. Right. This is the evidence of a once great nation in rapid decline, Fine, yeah. headed toward death. And apart from a spiritual revival, getting us out of our, right. like, what is my identity? What is my purpose? Who am I? What is my gender? What right. is my sexuality? If you keep going in, it's a black, it's just right. a black hole of sin right. and death right. and it's hopelessness. So the end result is just be depressed, self-medicate, vote for people to pay your bills and then kill yourself. Right. And that's where we are. Right. It's just, this is what it would look like if Satan set the agenda. Right. And yet at the same time, it's like the church has more resources, more ministries, more reach, more opportunity. Like what, what is missing here? Balls. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. That's what's missing. And the demasculation who, of yeah, men. Well, well, so I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, Elijah, and uh, I think it's in Second Kings nine. Yeah. Jehu, who's he's right. he's a dude. Right. He goes to arrest a dude. and deal with Jezebel, and it says that she's surrounded by her eunuchs. Yeah. That's what happens. The Jezebel spirit runs the country, and castrates all the men. And if it's not physical, oftentimes it is. It's mental, spiritual, emotional. Yeah. And so what you're what you end up with is just a bunch of castrated dudes, and uh, and I'm telling you, and I mean I love pastors and I love churches, but man, if we got invaded, uh, pastors would not be the guys fighting to hold the line. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, so they're they're great for the Salvation Army, but they wouldn't make the real army. Right. You know, there's not a lot of fight, and and what we've done, we've taken a whole generation of men, and we've said. 
you know, Jesus is basically a, a very soft guy who never offended anyone. Right. And if you want to be like Jesus, make sure that uh, everybody likes what you say and nobody's right. triggered. And it's right. like, we, we, we overlook the fact that like, there's a reason they killed him. Right. He didn't get along with everybody and not everything he said was particularly well received. And so I'm not looking for, you know, fight and conflict and being acrimonious, but at the same time, it's like, you know, we even saw during COVID, it's like, is there anything you're willing to fight for? I know. Yeah. You're going to fight for worship. You're going to fight for Bible right. teaching. Right. You're going to fight for fellowship. You're going to fight for evangelism. You're going to fight for church. Nope. Yeah. It's like, well, then you have no fight in you. And, uh, and, and so to me, it's like, it's just the lack of courage is just freaking shocking. Yeah. It's shocking. Do you feel like the church in America learned a lesson from COVID? Yeah, how to lay down and take it. Yeah. I don't think they learned a lesson. I, I think I think they surrendered. Yeah. And so, and what happens is, is, you know, a lot of the pastors I talked to, and I love pastors in churches. I'm not going to pick on any individuals, but it's like a lot of the pastors were like, well, we're just going to hit pause and then we'll hit play. It's like, that's not how this works. Right. You know, like either you're walking with it. Right. That's like saying, I'm going to take a year off from my marriage and we'll pick up where we left off. Yeah. Like it doesn't, well, I'm going to take a year off of my parenting and then pick right. up where we left off. Like yeah. that's not how this works. Right. So church attendance has cratered. Uh, Wall Street Journal uh, also had a report saying 50% of pastors want to quit. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you could do one of two things. You can quit or you can fight. Yeah. And I would fight before, you know, before you just give up on Jesus, Christianity, the church. I mean... If we do believe that Christ died for the church and that God's plan for the world is the church, then the church has got to find a little courage and a backbone and has got to be willing to say the hard things, do the hard things, not in an angry way, but to create a safe, loving, spirit-filled counterculture where God's people can thrive as an example and an right. alternative to what's happening in our culture. Like you come on campus at a church, it should be like, these people are joyful. Yeah. These people love each other. Yeah. These people seem unburdened. Yeah. These people are looking forward to the future. Right. Nobody else is. What do right. they know that right. we don't know? Totally. Or, or who do yeah. they know that we yeah. don't know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I think about even the, the origins and the birthplace of, uh, of the nation and the history of like what God's done here in America. And I mean, like the American Revolution started in the pulpits, right? So, I mean, that, that, it started with pastors. It yeah. started with them. They were the ones that ignited the people across the colonies to say, we need to fight back against this. I mean, they were the, they were the catalyzers. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen that famous or, or read that famous story, you know, the guy's preaching and he's done and he pulls off his, 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 his uh, you know, Sunday... Um, you know, suit that he has on and underneath he had a, you know, an army mm -hmm. uniform. And I feel like this is one of those moments where yeah. it's like, dude, we need to, we need to raise up. Like we need, we need the generals to, yeah. to rise up, take a stand, speak the truth. Cause I don't expect the culture to right. obey God, but if the church doesn't, there's no hope and there's no alternative. Right. You know, and so I, I, for me, I don't, I don't expect America to, you know, open the Bible and do what it says. But if that doesn't happen in the church, then you don't even have a church. Yeah. Well, you, you, and you have this unique, I mean, you're, you're not just working out your response to the culture in theory, because of course you're doing, you're, you're doing these teachings, you're blasting this out there, but you actually have a local church experiment. I've been in the pulpit for 27 years. Right. And you have a local church here and you're yeah. working these concepts out. What would you say to people that don't have that? And then it just, even as they listen to this, they're just like, you're right. We're screwed. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's why everybody keeps, you know, just wondering like how, I mean, even a recent Gallup survey, even non-Christians think we're living in the end times. Yeah. I mean, even the non-Christians are like, this can't go forever. Like we used to watch the purge and now we're doing it. Right. You know, like, you know, I mean, and so at the end of the day, you know, I love the local church and I'm a pastor in a local church and 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 it has been the best thing. Like honestly, like COVID and you know, the the nonsense of the woke joke folk and the BLM demonic counterfeit right. of real justice and all of that stuff. Yeah was a beautiful, it was one of the best seasons of 
my whole family's life. We we opened the church. We we decided, hey, it's summer. We're doing swimsuit summer. Hey, kids, wear your swimsuits. We're going to put up water slides and sprinklers and squirt guns and popsicles and <clears throat> and we're just going to practice for heaven. Right. Cuz it's it's hell right here. Right. So why don't we carve out a little spot where we can practice for heaven cuz we believe not only are we going to heaven, right. but we'd like heaven to come to us right. and do a little internship before we get there. Yeah. And so like it was a beautiful time for our family, for our church yeah. family. It was a healthy time, joyful time. My kids don't have the mental health and the trauma and the brokenness and all of that because we just decided, hey, we're yeah. going to live by faith, right. not by fear. Yeah. We're not going to be anti-authority, but we're going to be pro-God's authority. Right. And we're just going to march forward yeah. in faith and see what God has for us. And it was beautiful. Yeah. But now what we did, we, we, sh we ran this massive psychological experiment on a whole generation as a dad. It just infuriates me. It's like, everybody be terrified, go home, you know, live on social media, believe what you're right. being force fed, totally. get triggered and just wait for the government to send you money and live with your mother into your 30s. And now it's like, oh, those people are not uh, encouraged and they have mental health and they're depressed. It's like, well, yeah, no kidding. Of course. You just took away their life <clears throat> and gave them a right. massive debt that they're supposed to pay off without going to work. Right. <laughs> like, even if you don't believe in Jesus, believe in math. Like, this right. doesn't work. Right. And so, yeah, it, as a dad with kids and now grandkids on the way, it's just like, this is such short-sighted, stupid thinking yeah. from top to bottom and yeah. a total lack of courage. I mean, right now, from the White House to the outhouse, there's just no courage anywhere. Right. Yeah, and uh, you know, to your point about in the COVID season, I mean that, that's one of the reasons why we you went on tour. Eat, and well, yeah. we, but we took our kids out of school. It was like every day it was getting canceled. You didn't know soccer was canceled, basketball was canceled, football. You know, it's like you know what we're going to control the narrative of our kids. They're going to watch God break out in cities across America, and it's going to be amazing. And so we we did turn it into an incredible journey that will be unforgettable. And we'll never forget it. Um, what would you say, like, the church being positioned in this hour? And I think, what, what, here's my tension. I vacillate, right, between, like, I'm a hope guy. Like, I'm a worship leader, and I, I, I love seeing God break. I go into war zones. I go into red light districts. I go into gnarly places. I love seeing God show up. Yeah. It's part of what I've always done in my life. It's part of, I like to go in dark places. I like to go against the odds and see God do stuff. But it, reading stuff like this and seeing the trends, dude, it, quickly, it's, it's it's disheartening. It's discouraging. It's it feels like you're pushing a rock up a hill and you don't know how you're ever going to get there. Um, what what is the role of the church, the people of God, in this kind of a season? So. Um... You know, there's kind of two views of how church should operate, in my mind, historically. There's missionary, where we yeah. go out and reach the culture. Right. And then there's monastery, where we create a, a minority subculture that is healthy and loving. And we invite people right. to come into that and see, isn't this a better way of life? Yeah. And so I think in the history of America, it really started with, you know, Puritans and such. It was really missionary. Right. You know, we're going to go. And the history of America has been missionary. And I think for church, you've really got to consider monastery. Yeah. And so for me, like I see our local churches, monastery, loving, healthy, relational, right. joy-filled community. Right. You know, and then I see real faith as missionary. Send out Bible mm. teaching, declare war, right. hit the issues, live on social media, punch some things in the mouth that need to get punched in the mouth. And so, you know, what would it look like if the church was like, you know, we're not trying to reach everyone. We're trying to be healthy and reach whoever wants to consider an alternative way of life. And and I think what we need to understand is now Christianity, biblical faithful Christianity is such an outlier minority. And the culture doesn't necessarily think that we're wrong. They think we're evil. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, totally. if, if someone or something is evil, you have to attack and destroy totally. them. If they're wrong, you can just disagree. But if they're evil, you have a right. moral obligation to, right. to stop them. Right. And you need to understand the culture we're in now, especially in the bright blue dots in the cities, like if you're on some farm in some rural outlier area, you know, maybe you're not dealing with it. But if you're in any of the bright blue dot cities, 
they think that having kids is evil. They think that believing in men and women is evil. They think that believing the Bible is evil. Right. It's not just we disagree like right. you're evil. And so when you're in a culture where you're a minority, you're a subculture, and you're considered evil and outcast, what about turning the church into not a closed community, but a healthy guarded community that is open to those who want to come and see something that provides an alternative to the, to the, to the grand narrative of the culture. Right. And that's where, you know, I think the whole days of like the biggest church in the world, I don't know if people are going to be building big buildings anymore. Yeah. You know, and I think anymore, you know, <coughs> it's about, you know, do we have <coughs> space for kids? Do we have mm -hmm. places for people to gather? Are we offering classes on marriage and parenting and family? Like, like for me, I do men's ministry every week. Men's ministry is oftentimes the biggest ministry that we have. And it's just getting a bunch of men and saying, here's what a man is and here's what a man does. Right. And the older men are like fathers and the younger men are like sons. And the young guys are showing up and they're just like, nobody ever told me what a man is or what a man does. Well, yeah, right. that we need to do that. Right. Because you can get a women's studies degree. You can't get a men's studies degree. You can go to college and figure out what's wrong with men, but not right. how to be a right. solution. Yeah. You know, like... Again, like, where else do you go? If you want to be married, where do you go? You want to have a kid, where do you go? You want to, you know, stay in your lane and be a man or a woman, where do you go? We're down to one option. Right. And if the church is in the middle of apologizing <coughs> for what we believe, <coughs> rather than teaching it, then then God's people are without hope. And I know there's a lot of very frustrated Christians who are like, I would love to have a genuine, healthy church community. And there's such weak sauce oftentimes in the pulpit. That's why they're attracted to talk radio and the political right, right. commentators, yeah, and totally. the cultural commentators are right. like, just give me someone that right. speaks English right. and talks about totally. reality. And, and, and that's the thing is like, I, I understand the gravitational pull for people to those kind of personalities. But at the end of the day, so many of those talking heads are without hope they don't they're not carrying the gospel they're not carrying truth just triggering anger and fear right, anger exactly. and fear and anger and fear and anger and fear and that's what they do just boom 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 it gets people more fired up you know it's, you got the people that they just you go in their house and it's non-stop fox news all day long all day long you know what can i get triggered about today what can i get angry about today and it, it feels like we, we we have to approach this season differently i like the monastery idea i like that that thought about about coming away i also believe you know I, we rarely see historically and not just in american history i think it, it, in in revival history and world history we rarely see the church uh growing under affluence we rarely see it growing under under you know i mean i when i say affluence i guess you could take it from the survey from 98 to I don't know, maybe early 2000s or maybe late 2010s. You know, those those eras where things are growing and everybody's great and the economy's crushing and whatever. It's like we never historically see the church grow in those seasons, mm -hmm. you know, where we see what we're seeing right now in the underground church in Iran, where it's, it's the fastest growing church in the Middle East and it's the most persecuted. Yeah. You know, or in Iraq where I just was a few weeks ago. Or in you know um, the tribal places in India right now, where they're getting attacked and firebombed by radical Hindus, and they can't stop the spread of the church. So in some ways, I, my hope is is that even under this immense persecution, and I will say persecution because you're right, they they hate the church, they hate the Bible, like it is full blown antichrist demonic yeah. in, demonically inspired behavior and i never imagined i would i would i would see this revealed in the way it's revealed in america in our day now i know you were up in <laughs> the seattle area yeah, for a preaching long preaching the time, chop so zone you... for a few decades and <laughs> this doesn't this is not like a ninja that right, snuck up right. on you yeah, totally. like, yeah yeah but for a lot of people you know in, in america and even in some of the big cities that had big churches and ministries for a while like I, they might even be kind of sidetracked. I mean, you you look at, I, I mean, it's just, it's it mind-boggling. I mean, you look at Congress last week. It's like they, they're, they're voting to allow parents to just simply see what their kids are being educated with. Like, just to see it, not even to change it. <laughs> it's literally just so parents could know, this is actually what your kid's being taught. Not one Democrat voted for that. Yeah. For transparency. Just transparency. 
Like it's mind boggling. It's like, if, if you don't recognize the agenda of indoctrination, you know, if you don't recognize the agenda, they don't want you to know. No. Well, that's where it, God gets replaced by government Yeah. and fathers get replaced by government. And so those are the two things you need. You need God and fathers. Once you remove right. those two, government takes over. Yeah. And, and that's why churches really, if they want to do anything helpful, they've got to focus on men. Yeah. And reaching men and teaching them to be husbands and fathers. So we like the, the, <clears throat> the shirt, all, all the guys that real men like is more fathers, less government. Right. And that really is the issue. If you have more fathers, you don't need more government. You need less government. Right. Uh, but that's that's what we've done. We've gotten rid of God and we've gotten rid of fathers and husbands. And then you have women and children that are dependent on the state. And then the state wants to brainwash them into voting for people and things that will perpetuate their agenda and right. hold their power. It's right. it's very simple. Your, your ideas don't work unless you educate people uh, who are not wise enough to know the difference, to think that they're being told the truth. And the problem with the child is, I mean, we love kids, but the problem with the child is they think if an adult says that it's true. Yeah. There's a certain point in your life where you're like, I don't think the, I don't think the adults know what they're talking about. Yeah. But if you can start to mold <clears throat> that mind before right. that age, you're going to control the future. Yeah. Ideas so good. You got to brainwash everyone to believe them. Mm -hmm. They're just that good. Yeah. Or you got to pay for everybody to believe them. Yeah. As if we saw, as when we saw in COVID, what, um, I know in your recent sermon series, you were very, very clear, which I was appreciative of, on your views uh, on Biden and Harris, and you didn't mince words. Tell me about that. Well, I'm in Elijah. So I'm a Bible teacher. <clears throat> I preached uh, through, I think a preached or taught through the majority of the books of the Bible right. at this point. Um, and so in Elijah, my thesis is, uh, we have new days, but old demons. Mm -hmm. And that uh, there's what happens in history, and then there's what happens in the unseen realm. Yeah. God, Satan, demons, angels, behind the scenes. And so in Israel, you've got Ahab, right. who is a passive king, but he's good at military and money. Jezebel, who's his demonic, seductive, high control, evil wife. And the question is, do these spirits still work today? Are there men who are passive and women who are controlling? <laughs> is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> in government, in politics. Yeah. And like you look at the White House, you're like, okay, let's just hypothetically say <clears throat> that there was an ancient government led by a passive man who really was overrun by a domineering, high controlling woman who slept her way to the top. That's what happened in Israel. And you're like, hmm, wonder if that would ever happen Very again. Very contemporary. <laughs> very contemporary example. I'm just asking questions and throwing out connections. Wow. You know. Yeah. And what's been the response to that? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, I'm a one, in, I'm a one in five star review guy. That's yeah. Just, you know. <laughs> not a lot in the middle. Yeah. Not a lot of twos and threes. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Let me ask you this. It's a very interesting, like, how do we get to a place where men of God are not apparently allowed to criticize the government. Well, so that's the Jezebel spirit. I mean, we're, we're, shouldn't it be men of God that always, like, I'm talking about biblically. This is this is the pattern, like, men of God are the only ones. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Have, have been able to criticize, prophesy, release judgment. I mean, we see this throughout the Bible. Why is that like a no-no now? Because we don't have any prophets. <clears throat> or if we do, we have the weird counterfeit, bizarro tinfoil hat, medical marijuana, Trump prophets. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, what? Like, you know, um, you know, so I mean, those guys are just, they're just flat out freaking weird. Yeah, they're just weird. Um, and they're, you know, all their prophecies are about America and Trump, not about Jesus and the kingdom. I mean, they've, they've really, they've, you know, they thought they were kicking it through the uprights and they were kicking it into the concession stand. Yeah, you know, like yeah. you, you had the wrong goal in mind. Um, but a, a true prophet is, and I know that there's going to be certain cessationists who are going to argue with this because, you know, it's not like they have converts to disciples, so they've got free time. But um, <laughs> what happens with those guys is like, oh, no prophets. A prophet is the one who brings the word of God in such a way that it forces people to make a decision 
whether they're going to repent or they're going to fight back. And so right. prophets, <clears throat> so it says this of Elijah, I mean, first and second Kings, um, he comes before Ahab and Ahab says, you're the troubler of Israel. He's like, yeah, that's my ministry. Right. Some people have a, there is a good troublemaking. Right. You're either going to get in trouble right. with God totally. or the government. Yeah. So you're like, well, if I'm not going to get in trouble that. with the government, I'm probably going to get in trouble with God. Right. So I'm probably going to get in trouble with the government so that I don't get yeah, in trouble yeah. with God. Like when the government and God totally. are in conflict and you're in the middle, the question is not, am I going to get in trouble? Like, who am I going to get in trouble with? Right. What am I going to get in trouble right. for? Yeah. And so a prophetic gift is like, oh, I'm just going to say what's true. Right. And just deal with the consequences. And so. Right. You know, that's Daniel in Babylon. Right. That's Joseph right. in Egypt. That's Elijah in Israel. Right. Like all of the major and minor prophets, oftentimes <clears throat> what they're speaking against is a compromised church, right. uh, a, you know, a corrupt culture and a domineering, overbearing demonic government. I mean, that's what they're against. Right. And, uh, and today what we have is we have politicians and we don't have prophets in the pulpit. Wow. And what a, a politician always does, they're, they're, they're worried about approval ratings. They're listening to their constituency. And every year they're running for office by providing what will get them reelected. Most prophets are not trying to get reelected. They know they're probably going to be killed. I mean, if you're a true prophet, you really don't need a retirement plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not going to get there. And so, you know, what denominations have done and what seminaries have done and what Bible <coughs> colleges have done, in addition to all the good of teaching people the word of God, the only guys that make it through that are not prophets. And prophets wow. walk out of the woods. They don't walk right. out of the institution. You know, right. Elijah shows up. Yeah, come I mean, on. he looks like the perennial winner of a loan. And right. I, I say, if Rip in Yellowstone got saved, he'd be Elijah. I mean, he's that guy. <laughs> yeah. He's that guy. Totally. But he'd never make it through 15 minutes of Bible college. Yeah. You know, because he's, yeah. you know, he's got a dip in his mouth and he doesn't tuck his shirt in and, you know, right. he doesn't, he doesn't exposit Greek words and people are offended. And so, right. you know, but what, <clears throat> what we need is not the anti-authority, QAnon, conspiracy theory, nuttier than a Snickers bar, rebellious folks, but genuine right. Holy Spirit filled yeah. troublemakers totally. that are willing to get in trouble and make noise for things that God sends them to do. Yeah. And I'm not talking being anti-authority, I actually believe highly in spiritual authority, but saying that the word of God is over it all. And if God says something, then that needs to be heard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just feel like I, you know, I, I was, I was often, um, during the pandemic, a lot of people would come and, you know, why can't you just, you know, follow the, the Billy Graham thing where you, you know, you, you know, he did, he, he met with both Democrat presidents, Republican presidents. He did, you know, and what was interesting is in 2020. They don't want to talk to us, bro. I know. Well, and, 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 and that's yeah, why I said. It's not like there's a dude in a dress that wants to go to a game with me, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's where we're at. Well, and that, that's what I'm saying. The times are so drastically different. It's, it's, dude, it's, it is, it is binary. Right. Despite what everybody says. Right. Nuance and shades of gray is gone. They're gone. And people are talking at one another. They're not talking to one another. But when somebody's lost their freaking mind, it's hard to have a reasonable conversation. Right. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and even just to appease some of those folks, I mean, I sent invitations out to Obama, Biden, um, Bush. Uh, who else did I send them to? Obama, Biden, Bush. Uh, did you do and a Trump? Did you do a Clinton? I did Clinton. Actually, I did Clinton. Yeah, Clinton. Which, also, which one? All of them. And I sent them official ones to their people. Found out who their people are. Sent them officially emails and 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 messages, and it was legit. Of course, Trump was the only one that responded. Sure. And, uh, and, and. What were you going to do? Pray, worship? Yeah. I said, hey, come to DC. Uh, this was the uh, 20th anniversary of 9 11. 20, 20th anniversary of 9 11. Right? Let's sing a song. Like, 20th anniversary of 9 11. We have the National Mall, the most, you know, coveted real estate in America. And America apparently wasn't doing anything for the anniversary. And so I was like, well, we'll do something. We'll do a prayer meeting. It was open. It was did you, open. Did you go to Airbnb and book the yeah, day? Yeah, I know. Seriously. <laughs> I just, it blew my mind that it was open, actually. And yeah. so we ended up doing a thing at Arlington Cemetery, and we did a prayer thing, and we honored the troops, and blah, blah, blah. But that specific event, I was like, let's just invite all the presidents, and we'll get Secret Service. I'll raise money for it, whatever. 
Trump was the only one that responded. And, um, and then actually the Bush's camp responded after they saw that Trump responded. Anyway, it's funny. But the point is, is that people need to know we are not in that era right now. No. Like this is a different season, way more polarized, way more divisive, binary, like you said. And these, these people don't want to play. No. There's no coming into the middle and agreeing. I mean, when all of Congress, like when a baby survives an abortion and a botched abortion and it's laying on a table alive and every single Senate Democrat besides Manchin votes for it to let it die, what else do you talk about? Yeah, well, at that point... Um... Every single Senate Democrat yeah. voted to let it die. I mean, that's where today, you know, like Kennedy would be a Republican. Right. And of so, course. you know, of course, in my background, like when you go to, for those of us that have lived in the bright blue dots, they always ask, like, well, what are the Republicans like? There aren't any. The Democrats are on the right and the socialists are on the left. <laughs> that's that's where it's slid. Right. You know, and if like if you're in Alabama right now, like churning your own butter, you know, you're shocked because um, there's still a Republican, you know, in your neighborhood. But like in those cities, the Republican Party doesn't have doesn't have an office. You'd never put a bumper sticker on your car. Right. Because, you know, Antifa would torch it. I mean, right. so that's where the that's where the country has slid so far to the right. left and the culture has slid so far to the left that if you're on the right, you're like, my goodness. I mean, you know, we're in Arizona. Arizona is more libertarian which is like if a, if a conservative and a liberal had a kid and it was drunk, that would be a libertarian, you know? Um, you never know what you're gonna get. Right. Uh, but even, you know, people here historically like Goldwater or McCain or even more recently Cinema, I mean, they're just, they're more left of center, but they, they don't go that far left. Right. But in most of your major cities, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's so far to the left that if, if you're like, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, and they want to murder babies and gender mutilate kindergartners without their parents' consent. You're like, that's the Grand Canyon. I can't find the right. evil Knievel totally. motorcycle to totally. jump it. Totally. <laughs> I, I can't. hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. There is no. So I want to end with this. So we're in the middle of this Kingdom of the Capital tour. Um, we're going to every single capital, which is actually every single blue dot dysfunctional crime infested. Yeah. Uh, corrupt, perverse. Yeah, the state capitals do. They're the worst. Yeah. They're literally the worst. And, you know, so many people have thrown out hope and thrown out, you know, it's like whatever. And so we're going to each of them. We're rallying the church. We're mobilizing prayer and worship. We're getting gathering pastors together to take a stand. But do pastors come against you and criticize you? And is there is there that pushback from from the guys who are like, oh, nothing public, don't be offended. I mean, I mean, some of them are, but I mean, we, we, I mean, we've, gosh, man, we've, we've crossed that bridge a long time ago. I mean, those, those folks won't even entertain. I mean, we're, we're trying to reach those mid-level guys that are like, I kind of want to be bold. I kind of want to rise up. I just need to know that I'm a part of a yeah. group of people type thing. Like, or their people come. Cause that's usually what happens. The pastor won't come, people will come. And then the pastor's like, ah, I should probably be there. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you definitely should, you know? So anyway, we, we love it though. I mean, God, God's stirring up a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hope. And, you know, we were just in actually Alabama last weekend. We were there, the chief justice of the state who actually helped author the Dobbs decision. They took his writings in Alabama cause they were the first, um, mm -hmm. they were the first uh, heartbeat bill. They took his to formulate the Dobbs decision in Mississippi that went and overturned Roe. So he was there. He invited us into the Supreme Court of Alabama at the end of the event. The Supreme Court Chief Justice guy invited us in. We worshiped in the whole Supreme Court. It was really cool. So God's kind of preparing the way, but I, I, I do believe we're in it. Revival's the only hope. Awakening's the only hope. What do you think about that? Like, what, what is the prescription? There's no, there's nothing else. Yeah. It's like, well, the government's going to fix it. Yeah. I mean, no. Okay. Well, it'll figure itself out. No. Um, strong men will create solutions. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> you know, we'll just throw more money at it. Uh, no. no. 
Um, so either God shows up or everything we see is just stacking kindling to set on fire. Yeah. That's where we're at. Yeah. And so, you know, the good news is you've got, you've got movements of God historically, even like the Jesus movement. Right. Um, and you've got examples. And so, you know, revival doesn't, but, but here's the problem. And, and I, I say this to my, my, my Pentecostal charismatic friends that I love and I'm in that, right. I, that would be my <clears> team. Revival doesn't fix anything unless you have churches and discipleship to follow up. Right. Because if a whole bunch of people get saved, but they don't learn how to live, they just repeat their behavior. Right. Right. And so in addition to revival of you know <clears throat> churches and ministries, you're going to need Bible teaching, discipleship, because right. you're dealing with a whole generation that literally doesn't know. They're illiterate. They're, they're biblically they're, illiterate. They're biblically illiterate. Yeah. And they're just, and they've been brainwashed. I mean, right. my son, my oldest son works with students and, you know, he's just heartbroken by the, the mental health and the trauma and the brokenness. And, and his thing is like, dad, he said, I think they've come to a good conclusion. They realize I don't have God and life doesn't work. That's a really good conclusion. Right. Now you need God. But once you meet God, now we've got to teach you how to live a different life than the one you've been brainwashed for since infancy. Right. And so revival would be the beginning, but then the church and discipleship and Bible teaching and mentoring, uh, that's going to be a massive endeavor. Because a lot of churches are like, we'd like to see 10,000 people get saved. Okay, well, what are you going to do with them? Right. You know, when they when they show up right. and they've still got all their addictions and trauma. Right. Like we, right. And, and that, and that is, and I will say, I think what one of the most difficult parts of our journey with Let Us Worship was the altars were always full. It was Gen Zers and people throwing their drugs, throwing their crystal meth, throwing their, I mean, we had, we had Satanists come and throw all their stuff on the, on the stage, wanting to get free, wanting to get delivered. And then there's literally no churches that are open. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just mind boggling, right? I mean, churches started out of some of those events because they're like, well, we'll just start a church at our house or we'll just take them in. So there was some follow up, but that to me was the most tragic thing. It was like, we're throwing the net out there. And yet in COVID, you're not even open. Yeah. Well, making babies is fun. Raising kids is work. Yeah. And the same is true spiritually. Yeah. Like once somebody's born again, like somebody's got to raise them. Right. Yeah. So we need it. We need a discipleship movement. Yeah. In addition to the revival movement, there needs to be a discipleship movement. Yeah. There, and those have to go together. Yeah. And what would be your encouragement? Just some last words to people out there. When we're talking about revival, we're talking about, and these are the reformation elements, I assume, right? Yeah. The revival, the reformation, they go, they grow together. Yeah. Um, say uh, Susan out there is in Boston having a tough time doesn't know where to plug in, doesn't find any non-woke. I'm, I'm sure there are some, but but is having a tough time. What, what would your encouragement to a lot of those folks be? They're like, I can't be here in Arizona at your church. What am I supposed to do with all this? Well, I'd say number one, um, keep looking. Yeah. And I would say if you're a husband and a father, don't just keep dragging your wife and kids to every church. You go first, visit. If it looks, you know, you be the scout. If it looks good, then bring the family. Otherwise, you're going to really discourage your wife and kids. Um, and if it's just total nonsense, you want to be able to get up and walk out without having to go check your kids out of kids ministry. Um, and then if you can't find it, I would always be looking for and asking, is God bringing in a church planner, a prophet, somebody right. who's got some vision? Could I get behind them? Could I help them get something right. started? And if that doesn't work, then your, your only two options are, do we create that? Right. And a lot of people did that uh, during COVID. They're like, right. we're going to have people over to our house. Right, yeah. And just try and organize a healthy community of believers. Um, the other option is move. Yeah. And we're seeing people do that. Yeah. All across America, people are like, you know what? Church is not my 27th priority. It's my first priority. Right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the place where my soul is going to be healthiest, and then I'll figure out the rest rather than saying my soul is my last priority. Right. Yeah, I love that. I and actually so, do. You know, and so for, for there's us... There's something so old school about that. Well, there's, you, you use the word awesome. gangster. There's a little about it like, yeah. I quit my job, I'm selling right. my house, yeah. I'm downsizing my life, yeah. and I'm upsizing my soul. Yeah. And I think what people don't understand is, you know, 
you know, when you're, when you're planted by the, by the water, you know, when you, when you're, when you're a tree planted, you know, everything beautiful. Dude, if you have joy and you have joy in the spirit and you have joy with your spouse and you have joy with your kids, you're winning. I, and I feel like this is what I tell people. Um, I love beautiful places. I grew up in Montana, so I'm, I love mountains and I love, we live close to the beach now, but location is so secondary for me. Like it really is. And I travel and stuff. So I have that benefit, but it's like, I just like being with pe people of God. Like we, I could live anywhere. There's some places I would probably not want to live. You know, I've yeah. been very vocal with God about that. However, I mean, I lived in central PA for years, kind of in the middle of just central Pennsylvania. I lived in Texas. I lived in a lot of places. And man, the community dynamic is everything to life. Especially if you're gonna have a family. Yeah. Like who, who are our friends? Totally. Who are our kids gonna marry? 100%. Go who are our kids gonna marry? Yes. Like. Yeah. And I feel like we are in, listen, there are, I'm a big, I, I believe in rebuilding the ruined places, places long devastated, the, the mandate, Isaiah 61. But there are some people that are listening to this and you live in destructive, violence-filled cities of fear and horrible politicians and, and places where it's like, you can't find a life-giving church, y'all should just move. Seriously, you know? And I, I'm one that's like, stand it out and fight, but not everybody's called to do that. So, you know, you know Jesus says, prophets without honor in his hometown. Right. And, you know, Jesus didn't stay there. He's like, you know what, I did what I could. You guys don't want me. I don't really fit. Peace. Peace out. Yeah. It's not like Paul shows up in Ephesus. There's a revival. There's a riot. Right. Next thing you know, you know, the dude's pulling the chip out of his phone so they can't track him and he's running for his life, yeah. you know? Um, and so, you know, it's it, there are times when God sends you somewhere for a season and then he moves you. Right. And, and some people, I mean, like there's the time in Elijah where the brook dries up. Yeah. And you could stay there and die or you can go find another brook. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Well, um, why don't you tell everybody how they can find these resources? Realfaith.com, free yeah. Bible teaching. You get what you pay for, lower your expectations. That's all there. Lower your expectations. <laughs> yeah. And you have a big uh, Easter or Good Friday. So Good Friday is our big thing coming up. Everybody's okay. big on Easter, and I, I believe in the resurrection. I'm, I'm right. very excited about it. But Good Friday, Jesus' death. Why? How did he die? Why right. did he die? So we did a little documentary gorilla shot it in a day and edited it it's pretty cool it's dark it's not safe for the whole family um i don't think that you know <clears throat> caleb's gonna air it you know right. um and it, surprise yeah surprise, surprise. Yeah. um and so at the end of the day it's dark and it's gritty but it's it's very it's uh crucifixion historically medically biblically and personally it's less than an hour but exactly what did jesus go through and right. why yeah it kind of gets you ready for easter so if you don't understand why he died then how he raised doesn't have the full significance right, that yeah, it should yeah and how can they find that realfaith.com Real it's all there com. awesome thank you buddy thank you thanks for coming down thanks for bringing your family so honored yeah man. it's such fun a, it's such a life-giving time with you no thank it's been you. really good and i appreciate not always being the wildest man in the room so thank you for that it's been a real <laughs> ministry to me <laughs> god bless thanks thank buddy you. yeah